Thank you very much. Bukeka. And unity outside of the box. <sighs> Can you tell that you're in for something today? <laughs> now is the time to find an exit row. If you would choose to leave this service, there will be no judgment. <laughs> today is a day we're going to dive into something adventurous, dive into an exploration of consciousness, dive into the topic of unity on controversial conversations. Controversial conversations. What does unity teach about? And you could probably start filling in some of the blanks. Do you want to try? I get some questions, you know. What does unity teach about this or about that? Go ahead, throw some out there. What does unity teach about? The virgin birth. The virgin birth. Salvation. Salvation. Christ mine. Christ mine. Gay, marriage. Gay marriage. Some of you got it today. <laughs> We've done a lot of these explorations in this series of what does unity teach about, what does unity talk about. Today we're getting fun and frisky, so I hope you're ready. What does unity teach about when life begins, gay marriage, being gay for that matter, the right to die, stem cells, cryobanks, suicide, birth control, death penalty, female ministers, diversity, equality, gun control, gun safety, interracial marriage, divorce, birthing children, keeping them from being born? What does unity teach about these things? What are these conversations? Well, I'm gonna tell you today what unity teaches about these things. I'm gonna give you the unity statements on these ideas, all of them. But first, before I do, I wanna tell you a little bit more about myself. I'm 38 years old. I grew up in Indiana, went to high school at a, a school that was right near a college, Purdue University, so I grew up in a college town Professor was my father, professor was my mother, so from some educators I came. I went to college in Colorado, at the University of Colorado in Boulder, both in high school and in college. I graduated with honors, had a pretty high GPA. Let's see what else I can tell you. I worked in public schools for over five years, or about five years. I worked at camps. Um, did I say I'm 38 years old yet? Let's see. I am um, now the minister here at Unity Village Chapel. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Oh, yeah, I play the guitar. I'm a singer-songwriter. Um, sometimes I'm pitchy when I sing. Let's see. That's probably enough for now. So now, are you ready for me to tell you the answers to these questions? Are you ready? Are you getting me? Are you on the page I'm on? It's an absurd concept. And in fact, if we were using judgmental language, we could say it's an arrogant concept. To think that one human being could have more access to wisdom for another human being ever on this planet, and then the spiritual and physical reality. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that wisdom doesn't exist. Certainly, if we have something going on in our bodies, if we have a medical condition, we may lean upon, we may talk to, we may explore with someone who has an MD background, right? But as my friend and mentor, Mary Mannon Morrissey says, she says that MD shouldn't be mistaken because it can also stand for minor deity. <laughs> as is the consciousness that can flow through each one of us when we match our human consciousness and we match these I am's with our education, our background, our history, our age, however much we know, no matter how much stuff we can pile into that history or that idea of what we think is us. That's not the I am, that's not the identity that can help anyone 
find answers. That is not the I am that can teach or lead anyone to this concept of salvation to follow the will of God or any such idea. In unity we teach you need no intermediary. There needs to be no person in between you and the listening, the full potential of listening, of your spirit, of your guidance to the highest understanding of consciousness available in you, through you, as you, to you, in every single moment. And in fact, someone that has more education than you, someone that has more money than you, someone that has more status than you, someone that has more fill in the blank than you, is not as well equipped to deal with the conversation between you and your God as you are. That's what I think unity says about these topics. That's where I think unity stands on these topics. No voice should ever replace your God. No human sound should ever replace your ability and your practice of deep listening. And in fact, when it does, we've seen atrocities happen, haven't we? Really. In the name of God, in the name of what is really the ego in the name of what is really a separate sense of self. Now, does that mean that there is no answers, that there's no right or wrong, that there are no directions to go, that there is nothing to do? No, certainly not. But no voice should ever replace our listening to spirit. Unity has a history of as a spiritual practice, or we could say now as a religion, of being more what we would call progressive maybe, and that's a judgment, isn't it? But being more progressive, being more open, than we think of a lot of traditional spiritual paths. And that is because of that one thing that I mentioned, that one thing where we teach that it is ours not to digest the dogma, the doctrines, or the understanding of another and apply it to ourselves and to live from there, but instead to develop the capacity that the master teacher, Jesus the Christ, developed in order to be called the Christ because remember that Christ wasn't his last name. Christ was a consciousness that was earned through letting go of all outer ideas, from letting go of all ego ideas and taking everything in one's external environment and everything in one's internal environment and matching it against the heart. Matching it against the true source, the center, where we are in tune with wisdom. When we are connected with our God and God consciousness. And this being the practice, knowing that this practice comes with great responsibility. No book should ever replace the living doctrine of your heart. Do you think that books can be used and manipulated? I love this little pamphlet. Sally Taylor gave it to me, Reverend Sally Taylor, one of our unity ministers. She gave me this little book and it says, good news we can use, the Bible and homosexuality. Good news we can use. Sometimes books can be used to make points, no? Sometimes books, even no matter how much we agree upon them being sacred literature, are touched by the hands of humans, no? Humans that might have agendas, ideas that may be other than what we consider to be God, which is good, which is love. In this book, I love this part where Sally writes, and I believe they have this in the bookstore. She, she begins this whole little book saying, it should be noted that, and then she goes on to talk about the credibility against homosexuality in the Bible. And her last point 
is so profound that it's, it's, just, it's just silly. But it says, the word homosexuality and what we mean by it today does not occur in any of the original manuscripts. Hebrew, Greek, Syrian, or Aramaic, from which the English Bible is translated. The word doesn't appear in any of it. In the back, she goes on to note this. Oh, that's not the spot. There's another place where she starts to discuss where the word started coming up. And if I'm right, you're going to have to all grab this and read this. Is this motivation now? Maybe I should act like I haven't found it. She says, in spite of modern English translations, which include the word homosexuality, none of the language of these original manuscripts contain words corresponding to the English word homosexuality. The King James Version of the Bible, translated in 1611, does not contain the word homosexuality or homosexual. The first use of the word in an English translation of the Bible can be found in the Revised Standard Version, translated, and do you want to guess? great era of 1946. I'll let you read the rest because my purpose today and my point today is to invite us all into an understanding of listening to our own hearts, of doing our own research, spiritual research, not research based on limited ideas or someone else's notion, but research based on one-on-one -on -one experience. Because I believe one of the greatest things about unity's teaching is that unity doesn't tell other people what they should do for themselves. Unity doesn't tell other people what they should do or how they should live. Unity, in fact, does something that is completely different. Unity teaches people how to access the tools so that spirit can teach us all how to live in greater and better ways, more loving ways, more kind ways, more Christian ways, more conscious ways, more spiritual ways, more God ways. In scripture it says, above all things love. Above all things love. I just love that concept above all things love. And we know that scripture also talks about non-judgment, right? But it talks about a lot of other things too, doesn't it? And I know for me, I like to master a concept before I move on to the more intricate details. I like to master a concept before I move on to the more intricate details. So if the basis for the Bible is God is love, and we are to love one another, and where there is love, there is God, let us stay there in that consciousness until we have mastered it. And maybe at that moment where we have mastered it, maybe then we will have the wisdom to discern, to understand, to intuit, and to reveal other levels of wisdom. We get confused about what love is, though, as human beings. Unity's co-founders taught that love is the harmonizing power. It's the power that binds us. It's the power of understanding. If love is the harmonizing power, then with any of these issues, with any one of them, and you may have one that's on your mind today, What's right and wrong about this for myself, for my mother, for my brother, for my world, for my friends, for my votes, for my this, for my that? We all come with questions because we're seekers on the path. We're human beings making understanding as we go along. 
So for whatever question is on our hearts and for anyone that comes to us with a question on our hearts, what do we say? Do we say the framework of an answer that we have from our separate experience? Or do we say it's written upon your heart? The answer for you is written upon your heart. And I can support you in getting there. I can love you while you get there. I can love you while you uncover it, discover it, bring life to it. But I cannot tell you what it is. All I can do is tell you how I have found my guidance, tell you how I have found my truth, and tell you just like in the words of Charles Fillmore, I reserve the right to change my mind. I reserve the right to change my mind. So what is a deep question on your heart? What is a deep question in your world? What is a deep question that you wanted to ask yourself or you may have been asked, what does unity teach about? What does unity think about? What does unity say about this or that? The answer is not so simple, my friends, because we are unity. And unity says what every one of us says. Unity says what every one of us says because it reflects the consciousness that is the people of unity. I, for one, am proud of that consciousness. I'm proud of the activity of healing light that consciousness has in our world. I am proud of the living water that I see flowing from that consciousness that heals and reveals that God is alive even in the midst of judgment and confusion and discord. Faith is daring the soul to go beyond what the eyes can see. Can we live by a moral compass? Can we live by a spiritual compass? Can we live by a God compass that is more than what our eyes can see? That's what we teach. That's what unity is about. So we don't have books where we write down all the answers because no voice should ever replace the voice that is continually speaking in and through your heart. Even in the scriptures, there are stories about swallowing a scroll. There are stories about scripture written upon your heart. There are stories about the spirit of the law being so much more powerful than the letter of the law because the letter of the law can get stuck in human form. It can get messed up when you move from typewriters to computers. It can actually get really messed up if you leave out a period. Did you know that? In scripture translation, it matters, the spaces. I'd like to share with you a couple of things that unity does stand for. Because I shared the first one, that unity doesn't have a practice of saying that you need an intermediary, that you need someone else to show you or to think for you, that in fact instead the practice is to nurture your own, not thinking with a separate mind, but your own spiritual thinking, our own spiritual thinking. The next thing was that we don't decide for one another, that we have this loving practice of trusting that God is right where you are guiding you, guiding your loved ones. Even if someone calls us to pray and they say, save my loved ones, they've been taken by whatever, 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 concept, whatever scary thing. In unity we say, God is right there with your loved one, guiding her, guiding him. God is right here with our world, world guiding it, directing it through each one of us, listening to our own consciousness, our own conscience so deeply. But what does unity teach about these issues? There's another thing that unity teaches. I believe that we teach that we don't stand against something, but we stand for ideas of light. We don't stand against something. Because we recognize in unity that when we stand against something, we're actually 
activating an interaction with it. We're actually crystallizing an aspect of it in consciousness. And instead, we choose to come from a whole different place, which is standing for something, standing for what we want to see, what we know to be emerging. And we ask ourselves, not what is the right or wrong answer here, but we ask ourselves, what in this situation, what in this circumstance, what in this decision would be evolutionary? What in this circumstance would be progressive? What would be beyond the limited thought that I have to be in a place of a yes or a no, that I have to take a stand and cast a vote in a certain way based on my human ideas? What is evolutionary is coming from an entirely different place and focus on what we're standing for. Focus on starting. What is evolutionary? Let's take a look at a couple of Unity's statements as Unity has been so bold to put out in the history of Unity. Two that I know of, two. And that is in no way or no means because Unity is shy about its practice. It is in no way, shape, or form because Unity doesn't stand for something. I believe it is because Unity is so clear about standing for love. So first, Unity's statement of peace. Unity stands for peace in the presence of conflict, for love in the presence of hatred, for forgiveness in the presence of injury, Unity honors the many names for God and the many paths to God, the many ways to worship God, for there is only one power and one presence of God, and that God loves each one of us equally. It is therefore the position of unity to urge all nations, their leaders, and their people, that's all of us, to turn to God by whatever the name for guidance during these challenging times and pursue peace, not war, for this is what honors the God of all of our faith traditions. Unity stands for peace in our lifetime. And I would extend that to say unity stands for peace in our consciousness and that we acknowledge and take responsibility for that peace first being born within us. And when we take action, when we emote, when we think from that centered state of peace and love, we can trust what is created from that? But if we are in states of fear, in error, a separation of ego, of worry, of condemnation, of judgment, best not to create from there. Best to presence. The next statement, honoring diversity. We believe that all people are created with sacred worth. Therefore, we recognize the importance of serving all people within the unity family in spiritually and emotionally caring ways. We strive for our ministries, publications, and programs to reach out to all who seek unity support and spiritual growth. It is imperative that our ministries and outreaches be free from discrimination on the basis of race, color, gender, age, creed, religion, national origin, ethnicity, physical disability, or sexual orientation. Our sincere desire is to ensure that all unity organizations are non-discriminatory and support diversity. So what is evolutionary when we engage in these conversations? What is evolutionary? I believe what is evolutionary is to approach each other in a way that maybe your mother or your father approached you if you had the graceful gift of having a nurturing parent that would say something like this. When you're struggling with a question, when you're struggling with a concept, to look at you deeply, deeply, and say, I know that you will know the answer. I know that you have within you everything you need to make the best choice. I am here to love you, to support you, to honor the Christ light within you as you go on that adventure and that journey. Namaste.
So we'll have an offering for unity now. <laughs> 